Thank you for viewing this educational program, and congratulations on taking an active role in your health care. It is our sincere hope that this program will enhance the discussions between you and your physician regarding your procedure. This presentation is not meant to replace those discussions, but simply to make them more meaningful. This module provides an overview of urodynamic studies, including how they are done, why they are done, and what you should know prior to your appointment. The information provided is of a general nature, and some details may vary according to your location and to the specifics of your situation. To understand how urodynamics work and why we do them, let us first discuss how urine is handled by the body and how the bladder normally functions. Urine is produced by the kidneys and travels through tubes called the ureters to the bladder. These illustrations show the male and female anatomy of the pelvis from the side, showing the bladder and urethra. The most significant difference between the male and female urinary tract is the fact that the male urethra is longer and the first part of the urethra is surrounded by the prostate. As the prostate grows, it can cause some obstruction of the urine flow. The bladder has two important roles in handling urine. It must first of all store the urine that comes down from the kidneys. Then it must completely empty that urine and expel it from the body. Urodynamic studies evaluate how well the bladder performs these two roles. For the bladder to function properly, three different components must work normally. The nervous system, including the brain, spinal cord, and nerves to the bladder, the bladder itself, and the sphincter, or urinary control muscle. The sphincter is a muscle that squeezes around the urethra, and it is closely associated also with muscles called the pelvic floor muscles. Malfunction of any of these components can lead to a variety of bladder difficulties. Now let us examine the two roles of the bladder in more detail, beginning with storage of urine. A normal adult bladder should hold about 500 mils, or two cups, of urine, and normally we empty this volume every three to four hours. In order to store properly, the bladder muscle must stay relaxed as it fills with urine. Contractions, or spasms of the bladder muscle as it fills, leads to a sensation of sudden urgency and difficulty controlling the bladder. This is called overactive bladder. The bladder wall must also be able to distend easily, like a thin-walled balloon as it fills with fluid. A thicker or tougher bladder wall will also cause more frequent urination and control problems. Finally, as the bladder fills, the sphincter and pelvic floor muscles must stay squeezed around the urethra and keep it well supported to prevent urine from leaking out during sudden coughs, exercise, or other increases in abdominal pressure. When the bladder is full, the brain will signal when it is appropriate to empty. Even when we are bursting at the seams, most of us can exert enough control over the bladder and sphincter muscles to prevent urinating until we can get to a toilet. When we are ready to urinate, the first thing that must happen is relaxation of the sphincter muscle, which must be complete and sustained as the bladder empties. To empty, the bladder muscle must contract properly, and finally, the bladder and sphincter must be coordinated with each other during this process. Otherwise, emptying will not be complete as the sphincter muscle inhibits the flow of urine out of the bladder. Problems with how the bladder functions will typically lead to one or more of a few common symptoms. These include abnormal frequency of urination, where you have to go all the time, abnormal urgency of urination, where you have difficulty holding your bladder to get to the toilet in time. A leakage of urine, called incontinence. And difficulty emptying the bladder, called retention of urine. For each of these problems, there may be many different causes. Successfully treating the condition depends on properly determining the precise cause. To do this, urodynamic studies may be required and in many cases, they are an invaluable tool in sorting things out. Other tools or tests used to understand the cause of bladder symptoms include a medical history, physical examination, including a pelvic and or rectal exam, voiding diaries, laboratory tests, 
ultrasound, and cystoscopy. Cystoscopy is a test where a small telescope is inserted into the bladder through the urethra, allowing a direct inspection of the inside of the bladder. Urodynamic studies are not required for all patients with bladder problems by any means. Some of the more common reasons why urodynamic tests may be requested include when conservative treatment and or medications fail to resolve a problem, when a problem is complex and precise diagnosis is required, when surgery is planned or being considered, with problems following surgery, or when a neurologic condition affects the bladder function. The concept of a urodynamic test where small tubes are passed into the body, may be intimidating or distasteful for some. However, it is important to note that this is not a painful procedure, and the results of these tests are very valuable to your doctor in helping him or her help you out. There is little in the way of risk associated with a urodynamic procedure. Bladder infections rarely do occur afterward, but antibiotics are not routinely used for everyone. Drinking plenty of fluids after the procedure will reduce the risk of infection and also help to clear the small bit of blood that you might see afterwards. Typically, a urodynamic study takes approximately 30 to 60 minutes to complete, and it is usually done by a nurse or technician. A doctor may also be present for some tests. There are two types of urodynamic tests. Video urodynamics involve the simultaneous use of x-ray pictures periodically throughout the procedure, while non-video urodynamics do not. In preparing for your urodynamic study, there is little you need to do. However, it is helpful to review the following checklist. If you have collected voiding diaries, where you keep track of your urination frequency and leakage episodes, bring these along with you to the test. As with any medical appointment, it is always helpful to bring your medication list, including the dosages. Take your usual medication on the day of the exam. An exception to this may be your bladder medications if you are on any. These medications should be reviewed with the nurse or your doctor to determine whether or not you are to stop them beforehand. It is important to advise the nurse or your doctor if you normally take antibiotics before procedures, such as dental work. Also let them know if you have any concern that you might have a bladder infection at the time of the procedure. If you have a neurologic condition, it is important for the staff to know what that condition is and if you need assistance transferring from a wheelchair. Finally, some patients with neurologic problems get headaches or sweating when their bladder gets too full. If you have experienced this, please let someone know. On the day of the procedure, eat a normal meal move your bowels as necessary, and try to arrive at the exam with a comfortably full bladder. This may be difficult for some patients, of course, but as best as possible, try not to empty your bladder for a couple hours prior to the test. If you are finding it difficult to hold your bladder and are bursting at the seams when you arrive, let the staff know so that they can have you urinate on a special toilet rather than in the public washroom. The urodynamic study begins with an interview with a nurse, technician, and or a doctor. The procedure will again be explained, and a review of your medical history and bladder condition will be undertaken. You will then be asked to change into a hospital gown or similar attire, and will be taken to the urodynamics room. There are two parts to most urodynamic studies. A non-invasive uroflow study, where you simply urinate into a special toilet, and what is called a multi-channel study, which is done with catheters in place. The multi-channel study is further divided into two or three parts to examine bladder filling and emptying. All of this can be done with or without x-ray. When x-ray is used, the study is called a video urodynamic study. If you are normally able to empty your bladder on your own, you will be asked to do so in a special toilet. This is called a Euroflow test, and it measures the rate, volume, duration, and pattern of urinating. It also gives the staff something to compare to when you later have to urinate with a catheter in place. 
This photograph shows a typical Euroflow commode. After urinating, the nurse will determine how completely you emptied your bladder by passing a small catheter into it or scanning with an ultrasound machine. This is called a residual volume assessment. To begin the multi-channel test, you will first be positioned onto a special bed or chair, then a tiny catheter will be passed into the bladder. Another tube will be placed into the rectum to measure pressures in the abdomen which affect the bladder. Finally, electrode stickers may be placed onto the skin near the anus to record muscle activity of the urinary sphincter. While it may not be pleasant to have these tubes placed, it should not hurt, and any discomfort will be minimized if you are able to remain as relaxed as possible during this time. This photograph shows a typical urodynamic suite. There are many different setups available. Once the catheters are positioned, they are connected to a computer which records the pressures in your bladder and plots out a graph. You may then be repositioned on the chair or table, or you may be asked to stand. If you are having a video urodynamic study, an x-ray machine will be positioned in front of your bladder. Once you are set up, your bladder will be slowly filled through the catheter with sterile water, or contrast solution for a video study. As your bladder fills, the computer will measure pressure changes in your bladder, and you will be asked to report various sensations, like a feeling of fullness, an urge to urinate, or when you cannot hold any more. This part of the test is referred to as the filling systometrogram, or CMG. If part of your bladder problem involves urine leakage, or incontinence, then during filling you may be asked to bear down or cough to bring about this leakage. The nurse will try to record the pressure at which this leakage occurs. While this may seem a bit unusual or even embarrassing, it is important for the study to try to reproduce what happens to you at home. The goal of this part of the procedure is to determine what is called the leak point pressure or LPP. Sometimes, at the end of bladder filling, the tube in the bladder will be pulled back to measure pressure in the urethra. This provides a measurement of the strength of the pelvic floor and the ability of the urethra to close off and prevent leakage of urine. This part of the study is called a urethral pressure profile, or UPP. Once your bladder has been filled, you will be asked to urinate again into a special toilet. This time, the small catheter may be left in the bladder, and you will urinate around it. While unusual, this is actually easier than you might think. Again, x-rays may be taken while you urinate. This part of the exam is called a pressure flow study. Following the procedure, you can resume your normal activities. It is important to drink plenty of fluids afterwards, as this will help to clear any symptoms of burning of urination or blood in the urine. Rarely, it may be necessary to see your doctor after a urodynamic study, if there is significant bleeding or burning with urination that does not clear quickly, or signs of a serious infection, such as fever, chills, or pain in the sides. To conclude, urodynamics are a safe and well-tolerated procedure. They are an extremely valuable tool to assess bladder function, and they can provide information about your condition which can lead to more effective treatment. We sincerely hope that this module has furthered your understanding of urodynamic studies, and we hope that this knowledge makes for a more comfortable and meaningful experience. We wish you the best for the future, and thank you once again for viewing this program.